beautiful for spacious skies Por tus olas de granos In 1931, James Truslow Adams coined the term the American dream, which referred to that dream of a land in which life should be better and fuller and richer for everyone. The American dream tells a story of national identity that is all-inclusive in which each individual has the opportunity to achieve their own vision of happiness and success. However, in society today, there are specific groups of people who are marginalized and left out of the encompassing idea of the American dream. New narratives originate when one focuses on those stories of those who are oppressed. One narrative emerges through the issue of income inequality. There's a chart I saw recently that I can't get out of my head. A Harvard business professor and economist asked more than 5,000 Americans how they thought wealth was distributed in the United States. This is what they said they thought it was. Dividing the country into five rough groups of the top, bottom, and middle three 20% groups, they asked people how they thought the wealth in this country was divided. Then he asked them what they thought was the ideal distribution. And 92%, that's at least 9 out of 10 of them, said it should be more like this. In other words, more equitable than they think it is. Now that fact is telling, admittedly, the notion that most Americans know that the system is already skewed unfairly. Income inequality is obvious evidence that not all people can attain the American dream. However, as an economic and political issue, less than half of the population are concerned about the growing gap. In American culture, it is uncomfortable to accuse a rich person that being rich is wrong, but it's easier to point to the poor, that if they would just work harder and do more, they would be better off. While the American dream is technically attainable for everyone, in this narrative, certain disadvantages prevent individuals from accomplishing the vision, especially those who are at an economic disadvantage. This is also seen in the issue of gender inequality. The narrative Americans tell themselves about gender inequality is that it existed a long time ago and was resolved when women finally achieved legal voting rights in 1920. This implies that for almost 100 years, women and men are equal as voting citizens of America. However, while legally and politically women are assured equal rights, the facts show that this is often far from the case. Today, many women are still underserved, underrepresented, and generally unequal in America's economic, social, and political system. In 2012, women were still earning only 77 cents to the man's dollar, despite making up 46.9% of the labor force, and women today hold only 18.5% of congressional seats and they are just 20% of U.S. senators. While we tell ourselves the story that the efforts of women's rights activists paid off, the reality of the situation suggests women are still largely unequal to men today, and thus not as eligible for the American dream. The LGBTQ community faces similar discrimination and exclusion larger, in the larger American narrative. Since 1776, America has prided itself on the idea that all men are created equal, but many groups have been left out of this ideal, including the LGBTQ community. For example, just this year, the state of Arizona recently passed a bill that granted business owners the right to deny service to homosexuals based on their quote-unquote religious beliefs. This bill is evidence that Americans are still struggling with the idea of equality. Why? Well, even though it was eventually vetoed, the fact that in this progressive era, something as degrading as homosexual discrimination was passed into law is, quite frankly, regression. In addition, racial inequality still snakes its way through America, whether or not we'd like to formally admit it. Trayvon Martin, for example, was an unarmed 17-year-old black male who, on February 26, 2012, was shot and killed by neighborhood watchman George Zimmerman, thus sparking a tremendous public debate and critique of Zimmerman's motives as well as the court's decision to indict him. Even if racism truly wasn't an element in the Trayvon Martin case, the fact that it was the main point of discussion surrounding the ordeal says a lot about where we are as a nation, and that as much as we'd like to believe it, the debate regarding racial inequality is not resolved. Every American is told from a young age that we can be whatever we want. If you work hard enough, you can achieve anything. That is the American dream. But for whom is this true? Who has, and has historically had, 
purchase on this romantic ideal. It is undeniable that America's ascent has come at the expense of innumerable lives and massive oppression. It is often said that we have come a long way, that we have taken steps to rectify these uglier parts of our history. This is certainly true to a degree, but to frame our nation's historical narrative solely in terms of how far we've come ignores these difficult to reconcile, though perhaps most relevant parts of our story. Namely, that the reason we've had to come so far is due to the depths from which we began. To talk exclusively about how far we've come is to ignore the lowly point at which we started, and to avoid considering how far we still have to go. To reconcile the overt conflict between the American dream in theory and in practice, and thus to accurately construe where we are now, require a narrative of us that is all-inclusive and spares no ugly detail.